They say that success is built on strong foundations. So when 20 years ago, when Stuart Watkiss took the reins of Mansfield Town's first team, a side which was full of his youth team starlets, fans dared to dream of achieving promotion. There were twists and turns along the way and it went all the way to the wire. But in the end, Watkiss and his side made dreams come true. Ball into the area for Kelly, keeps possession, drives it across the edge of the six yard area, cleared as far as Hassel, back into the box it goes, and we're in front, Mansfield have it, and it's Andy White, it's absolutely nuts at field mill. Corner then, he's going to take this corner, holds both arms aloft, the uh, referee waiting to give the signal, Williamson's on the goal line, Greenacre's near the near post, into the area it goes, Tankard heads it goalwards, it's in, it's Andy White, Andy White's made it 2-0. And now we have a little bit of a comfort zone. The referee looks again at his watch. It's just about over. Three seconds remaining. The referee's blown and Mansfield are promoted to Division 2. Scenes of jubilation at Field Mill. This is the Mansfield Matters podcast and 20 years on, we're recalling the stories from that historic campaign with those at the heart of it all. This is Stag Stories, the glory of the Amber Generation. for helping to fund this night and put this night on for you guys. <laughs> 20 years ago, on the pitch behind you, there were scenes of celebration, not that I can remember because I was only about this side, about 11 years old, that showed me age. Uh, but uh, there were scenes of celebration, and it's a season that we all remember, and hopefully this year, to which we fingers crossed, Nigel Clough and his players can go on and uh, do the same. It's not all over just yet. You know, there was a little blip at the end of that season, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but in the end, we got over the line and hopefully we can do that this year. Tonight, though, it's all about looking back from 20 years ago. It's all part of a wider series here on Mansfield Matters as well. We're doing Steg Stories, the glory of the Amber Generation. Lots of great interviews for you coming up on our podcast feeds. Uh, more about that later on, including a nice little video message from a very special guest. More on that a little bit later on. But the man who's pulled all of this together, it's not my brainchild, it's not any of the Mansfield Matters crew, it's all down to the man who you score. Saw that goal on the screen just moments ago. His name is Andy White. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Andy, good evening, good to see you again. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, it is. It's good to see you, actually. I know, it's, uh, even though it's virtual, I think it's actually the first time we've properly met. I've been yeah, yeah, to each other quite a lot, which is uh, quite fun. Tonight, then, um, you know, first and foremost, let's just tell the ladies and gentlemen that are here tonight all about what we've been doing uh, with Form Players. First and foremost, it started off as a bit of a, an idea for a game from you, didn't it? Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, 20 years. I mean, it's, it's nice to reflect. I think lockdown gave us a chance to reflect on previous years and obviously with it being 20 years we wanted to try and get all the lads together um, a charity game out, out on the pitch but obviously with, with the stacks doing so well this season and the kind of question marks around playoffs and you know all the planning that goes into it it's a bit of a challenge in terms of you know fixing a day getting a day on the pitch and getting all the lads together so as a bit of a compromise we thought we'd um, yeah, get a little black book out and get a few of the lads um, over uh, Zoom or whatever software you use um, to, to rekindle and just reflect because 20 years, it's a long time, it's gone like that, but um, yeah, it's just nice to look back and remember and to be honest, it's probably only two goals I've scored for every career, so <laughs> I'm, 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 gonna, I'm making the most of it, just like getting every glean of uh, 
um, yeah, applause that I can get, to be honest. So, yeah. Well, it's fully deserved, of course. But we've had lots of great names on. We're not going to say too much. One in particular, which we interviewed, we're not going to say anything about that until uh, later on. But the others we can talk about a little bit. Just tell me and tell the audience here who we've been talking to and sort of what conversations and memories that sparked in your head. Yeah, so we've had uh, that statement from a kind of physio perspective and a bit of uh, insight into the management back then and some of the decision making. Obviously, we'll get a bit more of that tonight. Um, we've had Les Robinson, obviously, stag's legend, but a, you know, a Mansfield lad and absolute soul of the type of bloke. Loves Mansfield, loves the area, and I think that really does come through in the, um, in the podcast. Um, he was absolutely, when, when I played with him, he was a laugh a minute, honestly. You, you could not rest. So some of the stories that come out of that, and obviously from the, from the one we did the other night, uh, are something to behold. Um, who else have we done? Oh, Pilks. Yeah. Yeah, so Kev Pilkington again, he's from my, my village, so um, I kind of grew up idolising Kev really, and just seeing that somebody from my village could go on and play for the biggest club in the world, and uh, he eventually came, we played together at Mansfield and later at Notts County. So he did play for the biggest club in the world then? I don't, he did play for the biggest club in the world then, yeah. obviously, Mansfield. Yeah. Okay, absolutely, yeah. Mansfield matters, and we get on wrong, we get on wrong. <laughs> But yeah, um, Cashel Pilks, he's an, another top bloke, top professional as well. And I think from the conversation we've had, everybody ranks the time of Mansfield and the year we had get promoted as up there, and like as the top one or the top three, five certainly. So it, it lasts a long time. And when you do get promoted, it, it doesn't happen that often, you know. In a, in a career, obviously, it was the highlight time of my career. And it came when I was 19, 20. So it, it, it's one of them where you need to savour it. And so any opportunity to reflect back and savour it even further is um, a massive bonus. And the two guests we've got tonight, just tell us a little bit about them. I, mean, I know you've uh, had a little conversation with them in the corridor and brought back some memories already. I know you've got lots of questions scribbled down. Just tell us a little bit about what we can expect from uh, our two headline guests tonight. So obviously, um, Skip, Stuart Watkins, um, was my youth team manager, he was who I see as the one who actually gave me my dream to become a professional footballer. He gave me my chance, he obviously spotted me playing for Holland Town, uh, brought me into the club, um, he gave me that coaching element and the kind of experience within the youth team and eventually, you know, becoming pro. So it was he he supported my development as a, as a young pro and it was never my ambition to become a professional footballer but seeing the enthusiasm from Skip really did kind of come through to me and it was, it, it was just one of those times in my life where it was, yeah, you go, you go one, down one path or another when, you, when, when you're a 17, 18 year old. Uh, and luckily uh, Skip got one of me, uh, brought me in alongside you know, Liam Lawrence, uh, Lee Williamson, some absolute cracking players who actually went on, obviously, and uh, we, we got promoted with. So, uh, yeah, I've got a lot, a lot, lot to own, Skip. Um, and then there's Richard. Um, he was uh, one of the older pros when I first came in. Um, took me to one side when I was a kind of, yeah, 17 year old, 18 year old training with the first team. Um, gave me a bit of a, um, a, a bit of a talking to, if you like, um, and, and, and one of those older pros that you looked up to and eventually became youth team manager and then Skip's assistant. So, um, yeah, two guys who I've got a lot of respect for, but also um, I owe a lot to. So, really excited about tonight, really excited to reflect a little bit more, to, to hear the insight from the management team in terms of, you know, some of the decision making, some of the, yeah, goings on behind the scene potentially. So yeah, that's what we went into tonight. Absolutely, I must put pre warn you that there might be one or two swear words in there, but I'm, I'm reassured that for every swear word that we say, Andy White is putting a tenner in the swear jar. So, if one, so whatever you do, guys, make sure you fucking laugh, all right? I mean, I've already skipped, I've been to get in here, I've paid for being here, I've paid for... <laughs> so there you go. Uh, right then, guys, without further ado, let's welcome our guest tonight. The first is the assistant manager, the man who helped bring Andy through the U team and stepped up to be assistant manager alongside Stuart Watkins. His name is Neil Richardson, and also the man who was the manager to lead the Stags to success 20 years ago, it's Stuart Watkins. Please give a huge round of applause for Neil Richard Richardson and Stuart Skip Watkins. Gentlemen, 
Ben, so good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Skip, I'll start straight with you. Obviously, we were together just a few weeks ago at Scunthorpe when you were alongside me for, for co commentary. What are you doing tomorrow? Because I think we need a little bit of luck. <laughs> I'll be in sunny Wolverhampton tomorrow. Thanks for the universe. So, sorry. No can do. Oh dear, but well, hopefully, hopefully your presence back at One Court tonight brings that little bit of love. What's it like though to be back here um, after 20 years? I know you've been back fleetingly uh, since, but predominantly the last sort of seven, eight years or so you've been in warmer climates, so to speak. What's it like to be back at uh, One Court Stadium or as it was properly named Field Mill? It feels very strange, in all honesty. I mean, just driving into Mansfield, me and Richard just uh, had an hour in El Rosso. Not the first time we've been in there. <laughs> uh, but it feels very strange and not in a nasty way. I still feel uncomfortable about being here, if you, if you know what I mean. Just be speaking with Andrew. And I think it's because it feels like unfinished business, the way that, that, that we left. Um, you know, I said, people do say, oh, you leave a job or you leave a place, oh, I was devastated to leave, but I genuinely was devastated when I left this place. It felt like the, the end of my world. Uh, and I've only been back uh, two or three times since, since I've left in 20 years. Um, came back with Grimsby, uh, came back with Stockport, the season stacks got promoted. Uh, and I, I maybe watched one or two games as well, and, and that's about it. So, feels strange, but as, as Andy said, fantastic memories. Uh, we've just been speaking about some uh, down in El Rosso. Naturally, you start giggling. Uh, magical years, as I say, that, that day 20 years ago was magical, never forget. And. The evening, if you like, of that night when we, we went into Mansfield, the players went into Mansfield as well. And I kind of just stood back a little bit, if you like, leaning up against the bar or the wall of the bar or just walking around the town. And to see the place buzzing, it was literally buzzing that night, that Saturday night. Uh, and it's just, it just was a special feeling and it, it's still a very special memory. Absolutely. But aren't we so glad to see you back here tonight, ladies and gentlemen? To what's it like to see all the fans and get yourself back to the stadium here? Like Skip says, it sort of brings those memories flooding back. It does. I was just listening there, and I actually got goosebumps on me. Um, listening to the commentary and everything like that. It, it's it's been said before, and I'll say it again. It was an unbelievable time for this club. Um, from what a lot of people had done a lot of hard work before then, but I, mean, I, I was quite fortunate. I, I come into, the, I, I got, I came into Stuart's assistant after after the Leicester game, um, and it, it, it was for me. It was I can't turn that job down. That job, that job is absolutely fantastic job because we knew we had good players, we knew we had a great chance, and it, it and the whole for the, for the rest of that season it was absolutely unbelievable. The, the, the supporters were fantastic with us. Yeah, you can't please everybody, but we, I mean, not very often you get people standing in the sides of grounds at this place. You know, the other chairman's attack it, he wanted people in. <laughs> but it, 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 there was absolutely thousands of people in this place. And it was, it was absolutely fantastic to see. Yeah, and of course, you know, when uh, Skip stepped up to assistant manager, you were youth team manager as well, so you'd have spent a lot of time with this man. Tell us a little bit more uh, uh, about Andy, what he was like to, to manage back then, because before you came on, he was saying that uh, every now and again, you'd have to pull him into line. To be fair, I can't take a lot of credit for Andy, I'm, I'm, but I'm going I'm to say a man who did, and, and unfortunately, we've just lost him, Ivan Hollard. Yes. Yes. Ivan Hollard does so much work. Myself and Stu uh, were at his funeral last, last week and it was an absolute privilege. Obviously, it was so sad the fact that Ivan's gone, but it was a privilege to, to say goodbye to him um, because his work, what he'd done for this football club, will never ever be, will never be underestimated by us two, but will never be known by anybody else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's give that a huge round of applause. I'm sure <laughs> Obviously, 
you know, when you sort of took over, it was predominantly, when we spoke to the other guests, I'm sure Andy will agree, it, it's almost been like, it was the right time for you because it was essentially your team, your youth team that you brought through. Before we talk about you as first team manager, let's talk a little bit about, about you as youth team manager, the likes of the players that you brought through. Because you had some really good times in those uh, youth, youth management days, cup finals, cup semi-finals, that sort of thing. And all trained on a small stand-based Astro. Yeah, I mean, my first day as youth coach was uh, Leon Lawrence's <laughs> the Williamson's practice, this first day as apprentices. I, I got injured the season before playing. Um, I think first day of pre-season was the day after Beckham got sent off against Argentina at the World Cup. And that was the day I had it confirmed. <laughs> I, uh, that was the day I had it confirmed that I had to retire. Parky, thank God, offered me the youth team job straight away. So my first day was the first day of, of, of these lads. Uh, and it, it, it became apparent that, that they, were, they were special, that they had talent, you know, raw talent. And uh, just talking about Ivan, uh, not long after I got the youth team job, I couldn't get my head around the inconsistency of the youngsters. And I think it might have been just before Andy, Andy uh, come in. And uh, we were playing Lincoln on the top pitch. <laughs> and uh, it was the worst 45 minutes of football. And I, and I, I, was, I was losing it on the side of the pitch. And I just kept tugging me and telling me to calm down. And literally, right on half time, uh, we had a keeper called Kevin Tide. Great lad, great lad. Anyway, unfortunately for Kev, he dropped one right on half time. He literally dropped it into the back of the net, and the ref blew the whistle. So, me being me, he just went storming up to the pitch, effing and blinding at Kev, pushed him, uh, and Ivan's tugging me, going, You can't do that, you can't do that. And then the, the lads were sitting around the centre circle at half time, and I've got to give them the team talk. Liam was sitting there and I went, are you going to fucking tackle him? <laughs> Liam was sitting there and I went, are you going to fucking tackle him? And then I went round and I went, I was bullying me. He's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You fought it now. You fought it now. Anyway, <laughs> sent him out and play. And we drew the game one each, slightly better second half. And all second half, I even kept walking behind me going, you're for it now. You're not getting it now. The parents, look, they're gathering, they're gathering in the corner. So anyway, the game finishes and he's, he's sniggering over behind me. <laughs> so I've got to walk. That way I can't not go past the parents. And there's a group of them there and I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, what have I done? What have I done? And I go walking off and I get closer and closer to the parents and they're gathering, they're gathering. And to be fair to you, all of them came over and shook me hand and then I went, Skip, someone's needed to do that to them for fucking ages. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, and that was, I was first piece of advice to me, or the first real one that I still tell young coaches now is, the only consistent thing about young footballers will be the inconsistency. And to this day, it's, and that's how special it was. That's a special item was. Absolutely, fantastic story. Andy, one thing we've spoke about on the podcast when we've been interviewing a few people is the fact that Skip and his youth team were a bit of trendsetters, weren't they, in terms of the way they played? Yeah, and I, I mean, you, you, you've joked about the, the Astro turf and the sand based Astro turf, but I'm not joking. That pitch out there is responsible for a lot of development of these players and the actual intensity of how Skip wanted to play football. Because you come there on a Friday, bear in mind we play on a Saturday, and the, the, the tackles that are flying in, Ivan's been over those balls, ball times a little, Billy Dean has been over balls a couple of times, in terms of, you know, just that intensity, because it's non-stop, you know, the hard surface means that you need to be on it, your first touch needs to be bang straight away. And, and that's how it was, you know, you, you, you trained 100%, and obviously you played like that as well. And I think that transferred out to the pitch in terms of that high press. And I remember 
As soon as Skip came in, it was, you know, centre forwards. As soon as you get that go, it comes from behind, you go. And everybody presses. And it was the high press, you know. Uh, the Jurgen Klopp, you know, Pep Guardiola, we're all into that high press, but I was years in the It was it was <laughs> years in the it, it was here 20 years ago. I've got to say, uh, just a bit after that, Scott, we, we saw Scotty Sellers. Yeah. And, Scott, oh, yeah. and, and Scotty had played for Blackburn and Leeds, really good teams, and a, a special, special Newcastle team under Keegan. And Scotty's first morning, he come off, off the Ascot, he come over to me, and he went, never, ever trained like that. I've never, ever trained at that tempo at any of the clubs that I've been at before. And it, it was, if we could have played teams on that pitch, we, we'd have been in Europe, honestly, if it was the lads, the lads had just mastered the Astro turf. And, then, and he's back right, it played a major part in the development, but we had nowhere else to train. We, had, we literally, you know, I used to spend the first half hour every morning trying to get somewhere to train. And all, all around here, no one would let us train at the facilities. And I'd say, look, I'll bring cash with you. I'll bring cash with me, I'll, I'll pay you up front. And, and nobody wanted to do business with us because of a certain ex-chairman, Alden Woody. So, you know, indirectly, because of that, I think it, it, it played a major part in, in, in that promotion here, eventually, with the way that the lads have been brought. I mean, God has helped us if he was still here now, because they might imagine trying to tell Nigel Clough to train on that, that'd be quite a different story, absolutely. But, Richard, I'm going to come to, to you for a second. Obviously, we knew Skip's journey a little bit, like he's mentioned, sort of was a, a player with us, then dropped into the, the, the U team through injury and things like that. Tell us a little bit about your story, because obviously you were sort of playing sort of late 90s with us as well. Was it a similar transition for you? Yeah, well, it was very similar. Uh, I played in 99-2000 season. Um, I had a knee injury near the end of that season, and it, uh, I, knew I, I knew I was going to finish. Um, but but um, Billy Dearden, who I will always be forever grateful to, said to me, look, there's a, there's a possible coaching role going on, because Dave Bentley was leaving me um, to, to go to Chesterfield. He said, he said, would you be interested? And I, I absolutely loved Billy Dearden, and I thought he was absolutely fantastic. So I said, yeah, absolutely great, loved it. Um, so I, I took over as Centre of Excellence Director. <laughs> then Mark Kearney left fairly uh, shortly after. So I was pushed, uh, Stuart pushed up to assistant manager, and I was pushed up to youth team manager. And then Billy left in the, in the December. So I was pushed up to assistant manager when, when I followed him everywhere. I'm his, I'm his jinx. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and it, it was quite a quick process, but it was, it was something I, couldn't, I just couldn't turn down because, as Andy mentioned before, it, it was just such, it was so enjoyable training, so enjoyable watching me, and, and we all knew how, how good these young lads could be. Yeah, one thing that both Skip and Richard mentioned, Andy, is uh, Billy Dead and in terms of his influence. Just tell me a little bit about his influence uh, on you as well, because it seems to be that, that tight-knit thing behind the scenes seems to be a long-running theme of, of why that side was so successful. Yeah, and I think it just came down to Billy Dead as a person, as an individual, just being caring, you know. He, he actually cared about individuals. I think he had a really good knack, and I mean, Skip will tell you in terms of being a manager, you need to know how players tick. You need to know how to tune into every individual player in that change room. Bear in mind there's 25 players, but you need to know exactly what makes that player tick. And Billy had a really unique um, yeah. trait in terms of knowing. And he knew from me, and skipped it to be fair, in terms of, right, and he's one of them. He's not gonna he's not gonna react well to a rocket up his arse. He's probably just gonna go in a corner and cry. You know, he needs that arm round him, he needs that love and attention. And then players like Liam, they need the rocket up the arse. So he just had a real individual trait to know what to get players out of. And you know, just a nice bloke. I remember a few stories in terms of um, skip sessions when, when you were assistant manager. Um, pre-season certainly, because obviously we know that Skip likes to, to run into his fitness and um, he used to put the, co the cones out to do a kind of big fitness run up at, um, up at Sutton School 
And uh, Skip put this massive track down with all the cones, and Billy was following around going, I'm not in math for keep place. What they're uh, running back for? I was kicking him in. So yeah, he just he just a proper proper nice blow. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of your development, Skip, is from youth team coach to assistant manager and then on to management. How much has Billy's impact do you think really you know helped you to, to get you to where you got? Massively, because uh, I was fortunate, and obviously I love taking the training. Uh, but Billy's man management. As, as, as Andy touched on, you know, he, he, he knew the traits of all the different players and his man management, you couldn't help but, but, but learn, learn from him. And uh, he was a scruffy old bucket built on the training ground, honestly, he used to wear some baggy, tracky bottoms and socks, horrendous socks, odd socks, and he used to look a mess, didn't he? And, and the lads would, like, take the mickey out of him a little bit. But I tell you what, he come back and he'd seen everything that had gone on in training. Any little slip, any little bit of good play, if so and so wasn't quite at it or he trained well, Billy saw literally everything. So for me to learn off was, was fantastic. I love coaching, I, I felt I could coach, but I learned so much about management and to be fair, Managing upwards as well, the way that Billy handled the chairman was, was really good. Uh, it, it took me longer to to master that managing upwards. I was a little bit too confrontational, maybe a little bit too fiery, and, and, and Billy picked his battles and the ones that were really important. He won, and he'd, he'd let the chairman win two or three of the minor ones that he weren't bothered about. So. Terrific fella, and as I say, for me, just the perfect fella to learn off. Similar for you, Richard, as well, because you, you played under him a little bit, and you, you would have been in around him on the back room. Similar for you? Yeah, but Billy's man management was unbelievable. I've got a great story um, from, about him. It was Whenever we played away, if it was, a, if it was like a, a long distance trip, we stayed overnight, and this particular one was Plymouth. And I, I was one of them, and whenever I stopped in a hotel room, I couldn't sleep. So I, me being me, I thought the best way to sleep would be have, have a pint or something like that. So I thought, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll go from downstairs in the lobby up to my up to my room and order off the off like a few pints of Guinness so, so I can sleep. So I did that. I thought I was being clever. But next thing I know, knock on the door. I thought room service is here. Hold the door, and Billy stood there. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> He went, I'm on that one, you have that one, you better play well tomorrow. And walked off. I'm like, I thought I was getting fine. But that, that is the type, he, he, he knew everybody individually, and he knew what, how to get everybody to tip. The guy was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And Andy, you know, that was how it impacts on your career, as did sort of so skip as well. What's your memories from uh, that overarching season of, of sort of breaking through into that youth team and watching the likes of Liam, Deers, that, that youth team which you're all part of, break through into that first team and sort of Billy's impact on wanting to give them a chance? I think first and foremost, you know, I was in school, I was doing my A-levels, I was loving playing for the youth team on a kind of Tuesday night and a Saturday and, and I was playing with absolutely no fear. I really was, you know, I remember a goal down here against Sunderland and uh, Barnsley, you know, no fear at all. I, I never even, it was never on my radar to become a professional footballer at that stage. I was playing for Mansfield youth team, I was enjoying it, I was enjoying playing with these players, obviously better players than I'm used to playing with. But it just kind of escalated really. Um, and then obviously, when I was playing for the youth team, I can remember um, one, one Saturday morning I played for Stag's youth team in the morning at Notts County. And uh, I think, I, I, was, I had the paper round at this time, so for me, I was wanting to get away from the paper round and earn it £12.50 a week. So, skip this said, right, we'll get you 30 quid uh, expenses or whatever it was. So I was earning 30 quid expenses playing for Stag, so I did that. Went to, went to play for Stag's youth team on a Saturday morning. I said, Skip, where, where's my music? <coughs> brand name. Like, Here's your 30 quid hand. I said, right, cheers. Went down the road to Hawknall and played against Emily 
on an afternoon. Pick it up another 60 quid. So already I've got 100 quid in my back pocket, you know. From, from, a, from, a, from a paper round, it's 100 quid. I'm like, oh, this is all right, this. And I think, Skip, you must have seen it, or Billy. You know, I said about every detail. I must have seen that I scored for Horton in the afternoon. Monday morning, I get some phone calls saying, Andy, you know, well, what are you doing? So, well, you know, I just want to get out of this quid to quid, isn't it? Yep, yeah, it's quid to quid. I just want to get out of this rub of my paper round, basically, and earn a few more quid out again. Um, so I said, well, you know, this is serious now, Andy. You know, you could potentially become a professional footballer. So I said, right, I'll, I'll quit Bucknell and, and kind of concentrate on, on stags. Um, so it, it went from there. Then I trained with the, the, the first team through the summer. I mean, I was off a professional contract. And I know I've said that I never dreamt of being a professional footballer, but when Billy did, and, and obviously Skip brought me to our office and said, look, there's a year's contract here. I was like, I can remember the, the journey home with my dad. I'm like, I'm going to fulfil, you know, a boyhood dream to become a professional footballer. Um, and to be part, obviously, alongside players like Liam, Diz, Lee, Leroy, Jerv. We, we had a fantastic team. It was an absolute pleasure to be around. And, and, and I think when you play with good players, you, you become a better player as well. It's easier, you know. So, so for me, it was just, yeah, a dream come true. Let's touch on that team a little bit, Skip. Obviously, so many names in there. As you now reflect on the journeys that they've had, that must fill you with so much pride. Yeah, I, I still, I still, I mean, some of them obviously now have stopped playing, but for years, you know, if I was there anywhere and they, they come on telly, I, I, I was like that. People must have got sick of me. I was like, he's one of mine. <laughs> he's one of mine. Because of the pride, it was. Pride when you when you saw lads that, that you'd work with and, and, and don't get me wrong, first and foremost the reason why Andy made it and Liam made it and Leroy and Diz was because of themselves. They made it because of themselves, because they knuckled down and listened and, and did everything that was asked of them and put it. It was fantastic job satisfaction to see. Young lads, if you like, go on. I mean, I'll, I'll touch on Liam as, a, as an example. Liam had a, a bit of a rough upbringing. I hope you don't mind me saying it. His, his mum and dad was divorced. Uh, he was kind of living with his mum and stepdad. Uh, they had a baby. And, and to a certain degree, Liam was pushed aside a little bit. And he used to break my heart some mornings. He used to he used to come into the ground and his, his clothes were all creased up and you looked at him and he had no real guidance and he used to go out with his mates on the night when he shouldn't have been out. Uh, his, his, his attitude to football was always fantastic. He, you literally had to push him out the door at the end of the day. He didn't want to go home, maybe because he wasn't, wasn't, wasn't great at home. So, when you see a lad like that who's had a, a bit of a rough time, to go on and, 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 and see what Liam did, you know, and the likes of Sunderland and Portsmouth and then go and play in Greece and play for the Republic of Ireland, it's, it's fantastic, you know, and I only have occasional contact with Liam now, uh, I haven't seen him for many years, but we have occasional messages and what have you, I know he's working at Stoke now, uh, so, to see that and, and, and to see these lads, if you like, go on and do what they did is fantastic. But I have to say, in, in many ways, I'm kind of just as proud of the lads that didn't make it at football, but have gone on to be corny as it sounds, good human beings. I, I think like Dean Mitchell, who's involved in semi-pro football around here, Scott Murcott, uh, Kevin Tyre we spoke about. You know, I've seen them, you know, on Facebook and everything, I've contact with them on Facebook. And to see them turn out as just good people who have been successful in their own careers gives me just as much pride as seeing uh, the lads that actually went on to, to make a living out of it. And of course, the big part of that promotion season 20 years ago was those young lads getting a, a run into the side. At what point did Billy have a conversation with you and say, are these ready? Well, we had the conversation, and 
I think there were some injuries at the time as well, and in the end, we knew they had the ability. We thought maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit too early for them, but literally everybody, everyone that went in, and, and, it, and it's all, it's, it's kind of always a case of sink or swim when you put a young lad in, but they all, they all swam, and they all did well, and you've got to again give Billy loads of credit, because it's very easy for me to say, yeah, Billy, he's good enough, go and put him in. But it's on his watch. So to have the courage and the bravery to, to, to put the lads in, um, he deserves a massive credit. I'm going to flash forward a little bit to around sort of January time. We have a fantastic FA Cup run. We've, you know, we spoke on that on the episode, which we're not going to mention yet. Um, in the midweek, we spoke quite a lot about that and things like that. And, We've also spoke about Billy's departure and how he told the players and things like that uh, as well. But what point did he sort of pull you and have a conversation and sort of say, I think I might be moving on? Well, he did. So that season, we, we'd had a couple of really good results in the FA Cup. I think we, was it Huddersfield, we beat four, we were top of the league above. I think, I can't remember who else we played. And we'd been, on the Friday, we'd been to Billy's mate had a pub on the other side of Chester. So, to do something different, we went for a jog and a stretch, the other side of uh, uh, Len Badger's pub, and then we, we went back to the pub, and the lads had had a coke, and there was a bit of food laid out, and chip butty, and then they went out and played fantastically well in the two FA Cup games. So, the third round, we've got Leicester away, uh, chairman. Must have got his leg over that morning because he said he'd, he'd, he'd tag the lads away after the Leicester game. So on the third, we went on the th yeah we went on the Thursday to let Badger's pub for whatever reason, and then uh, jogging the stretch back to the pub, food, drinks, and the lads started going one by one, and I went to go, I went to leave, and the chairman got hold of my arm, pulled me. I don't know what I've done. And, uh, it's that complaint from the parents or the music equipment, that's what you think. And his, uh, his sidekick was there as well, if you remember Alan Meal, the, the emperor. <laughs> so the, the deadly duo were there. Uh, there's me and there's Bill. And, and Bill was acting very strange. I'm getting a bit, I don't quite know what's going on. And then Billy, mate says he's good boys and leaves. And I went to go again and chairman touched me. Stays. Billy goes and then it was the chairman who said, Billy's going to Notts County. Uh, he's leaving. He's going to tell the lads straight after Saturday's going on Leicester. We want you to take the job. So, okay. Blown away by it all. But if I'm being honest, I'm thinking, fucking hell. Yes. <laughs> I'll have a bit of that. Um, and then the, the, the chairman fires one at me. He goes, uh, what about Chris Waddle as your assistant? I was like, pardon? What about... Yeah, I'm Get some tissues. What about Chris Waddle? And uh, I said, I don't know Chris Waddle. I said, I mean, obviously I know who he is, but I don't know Chris Waddle. I don't know what he thinks on football, what his philosophy is, how does he see the game being played. I don't know. Obviously, Chris Waddle was drinking partner of the chairman in uh, Chaps in Sheffield. Uh, so, to be fair, Alan Meal said, No, I, I said, Look, I, I want Richard. I, I'll have Richard. I know Richard. I trust Richard. I'll have Richard. And to be fair, Alan Meal said, If he wants Richard, he, he, should, he should have Richard. Fucking hell, I wish I'd have Chris Waddle. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, felt very funny if you like, went to Leicester, 
decent performance, got one nil, uh, got beat one nil, I think it was. Two one. Two one. Two one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then to be fair, Billy told told the lads straight after, and there was a little bit of disbelief, wasn't there? I think it took literally everybody uh, a by surprise. So, but it was fantastic because. We were going away on the Sunday. They, they hadn't announced. They hadn't announced that I was going to be manager. But I just thought, just take the lads away for a few days. Um, they said, "Do you want Richard to come?" And I went, "No." Uh, so R Richard was left behind. <laughs> so Richard was left behind anyway because he had to tie up a few of those things on the youth side. Uh, and, and Andy might tell you some stories about. The, the Portugal trip. Um, but we came back on the Thursday, had to travel to South End, do you go Friday, I think, from Friday or Saturday, um, and, and lost my first game 1 0. But probably, if I've been honest, I still think that was the best I played as me as manager, even though we lost 1 0. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you mentioned Portugal there, Andy, it's time. It's time to share some stories. But it's not too many I can tell tonight, to be honest. It's just redact names, redact names, it's fine. It'll stay between all of us in this room. We'll make a solemn promise now to not let the, those stories leave the room. Nobody will get to... Uh, I can tell you a story. There we go. I can tell you a story. And these two stories. Who wants to hear a story from Paul? Yay! So we got to the hotel, and if I'm being honest, I, I didn't think the food was the best in the hotel. So, me and Baz would have a stroll down to the harbour, just me and Baz, and le left the lads eating at the hotel, and me and Baz would go and have a meal at the harbour and, and, and uh, a drink. And then uh, on about the second night, it, it, it got back to me from a player that the lads had found a lap dancing bar. <laughs> okay. So, me, me, me thought, well, if they're in the lap dancing bar, they're not around the town and they're not getting in trouble, so at least we know where they are. So we I think know. I'm now figuring out why Andy doesn't want to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't be able to lap dance in bar, Andy. Well, put it this way, I'm now married to my... Lap <laughs> 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 Finding a hug on who I've got a bit of time is now my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we we've, we've find, anyway, I, I pull. I pulled Bobby, uh, I think the next day, and I went, Bob, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he said, Stu, Stu, or Skip, sorry, I went down the last cafe now, come on. And uh, he went, yeah, there's got this lap dancing bar. Oh, all right, okay. So I said, Bobby, that's okay. All right, I'll let you, I'll, I'll allow it, because you're not out and about, you're not getting into trouble, you're not getting arrested. Uh, I said, but whatever you do, don't let the chairman find out. And he started laughing. Oh, what's up? He went, chairman's in there with us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still think Andy was in there. He went, he's got bright red. I still think he was in there. We were all in there. <laughs> no, it, was, it was one of them where, I mean, it, it wasn't. It wasn't branded as a training camp, was it, Skip? Or like, at least that wasn't how it went down. I think we did one training session on a tennis court. Yeah, I thought we went yeah. there. And so I remember it rather because we were we were around the pool drinking pina coladas all day long, and then went into this karaoke bar and Pemba on karaoke is unbelievable. So in the karaoke bar, then we went on to the the, the set club where um, yeah, there were a few girls in there, and I think I remember Danny Bacon running around going. Andy, Andy, she likes me. <laughs> Honestly, I thought, he was like, Andy, I'm in love. <laughs> she likes me. I said, I said Danny, they're all going to like you. They want your money. <laughs> so anyway, we're still the Peter Gliders, and I'm not joking, it must have been. I was rooming with Stuart Reddington. It was daylight when I got back, anyway, about six o'clock in the morning. We were still training the next day. And I'm not the best when I'm sober, but when I'm drunk on the training field, 
It's not a pretty sight. I remember stumbling onto training pits, falling over water bottles. <laughs> on there, it was an absolute disgrace the way I trained that week. And in fact, I was, was thinking, thinking you know, good. I was actually thinking, and it looks good today. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember I went to went to drink the, the, the water, and it, it just it tasted like pina colada. The, the water from the water was just tasted like pina colada. It was just like, yeah, it was uh, an eventful trip. And obviously we came back and uh, the rest is history, if you like. Okay, first time that I'm hearing those stories, first time as well for you, Richard, were you thinking, I wish I was on the plane? I just wasn't invited. <laughs> oh. Shocking, shocking, shocking. Uh, that's almost all we've got time for in this uh, first half. We'll have lots more to come with Skip, Richard uh, and Andy White, but it's time to reveal um, all about how okay, we've got quite a lot of stack stories. Like I said earlier on, at the top of the show. This is just part of a series that we've got coming up on the Mansfield Matters podcast, which is all about um, telling those stories from 20 years ago from the people at the heart of it all, some of which are in the UK, dotted around the country, others, not so much. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you at the moment. Um, you know, it would be, be great to be with there and, and share some, some wonderful memories, um, certainly some memories that I've had um, in my career. Um, it'd be great to, to catch up with Skip again. Um, you know, it was a big part of, of why I stayed at the, the Stags at the time I did. And um, so, so pleased we were able to, to get, get the promotion over the line. So just want to wish everyone all the best. Hope everyone's safe and well. And um, I wish you uh, all the very best. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Greenacre. <laughs> so that episode will be out for you very, very shortly indeed. We'll keep up to date on our social media of that. Obviously, we're going to take a quick 15 minute break. Then Alan's going to be here doing Biscuit Bingo. Then we'll have these guys back out again. Ladies and gentlemen, for now, though, please give a huge round of applause to Alan.